What is the origin of everything? How did reality become the way that it is? Where did it all come from? These may sound like unanswerable questions, yet us humans actually have tangible answers for them. The universe is unimaginably old and vast, but it hasn't always been this way. If you follow the science and work backwards, you can trace this void back to its earliest moments, back when the universe was smaller than the tip of a needle. Human beings emerged from the elements that were made from the lighter elements which were present at the beginning of time. There's a popular saying that goes something like, from dust you came, and to dust you will return. There's more than a grain of truth in it. Life is a product of atoms and evolution by natural selection. I guess you could say, we are the universe becoming aware of itself, and the story of our origins is written all over the night sky. And now, as we enter an improbable age of unprecedented technical sophistication, we are beginning to understand and retell that story like never before. Our model of the universe is based on Big Bang cosmology, the idea that the universe started at some point in time and has expanded ever since. Big Bang cosmology is the current accepted model of cosmology, but there are others. In this video, however, we will be rolling with Big Bang cosmology, and if we take the mathematical equations that describe our universe and its expansion and follow them back to their zero point, we come to a time 13.8 billion years ago where there was nothing. The universe was infinitesimally small and dense, its size was zero, nothing, akin to the singularity of a black hole. But then, something happened. We don't know what, but something triggered this point to expand rapidly, allowing its interior contents to breathe. As the universe expands, its temperature energy becomes finite and begins to fall, and at lower temperatures things are able to form. So, in reality, there was probably no explosion at the Big Bang. The universe began as infinite heat and has cooled ever since. The term Big Bang more loosely refers to the very early seconds of this universe when it was inconceivably hot. And thus, the universe of which we are a part today was born. While we believe it came from a point zero, this is not a centre, and the universe does not expand as a sphere would uniformly. During the early expansion of the universe, the metric of space-time itself changed, and so our models are currently insufficient to determine what the universe was actually like in its first moments. We cannot rule out that the universe was not physically small on its creation, and we cannot conclude on a definite shape. The points between unbound objects in all parts of space-time has increased everywhere in unison, and therefore there is no centre. For this reason, it is said that the Big Bang happened everywhere, and not at one initial point. In the universe today, we experience four fundamental interactions. Gravity, strong nuclear interactions, weak nuclear interactions, and electromagnetism. During the earliest increment of cosmic time, known as the Planck Epoch, these four fundamental interactions were bundled by the unimaginably extreme conditions of the micro-universe and were as one, in an overall unified fundamental force. We cannot test, prove or verify that such a godlike force existed, but many scientists agree that it did. It is possible that the laws of physics as we currently experience them may not have applied under these extreme conditions either. The temperatures and energies were so high that subatomic particles wouldn't have been able to form until later and the universe was a tiny hot mesh. A fraction of a nanosecond later, things started to happen. This unified force began to separate into the individual forces, with the temperature falling as the universe expanded. Think of it like water vapour, condensing onto a surface and then freezing. As space cooled, the quantum fields which created the particles and forces we see today were able to settle at lower energy levels, becoming more stable. This increased stability completely changed how these quantum fields interacted. This caused the single force to break into two and continue as separate forces. This phenomenon is known as symmetry breaking. The unified force continued as gravity and electro-strong interaction. Symmetry breaking occurs at ridiculously high temperatures, and we're talking crazy numbers here. When the temperature fell below 10 to the 28 Kelvin, this electronuclear force then itself broke into two separate interactions, strong and electroweak interactions. 
But this seemed to have a profound effect on the universe, as after this symmetry breaking occurred, the universe violently expanded in an event we call cosmic inflation. This expansion was incredible. In under a trillionth of a second, the universe had become at least 10 to the 78 times more voluminous. That's the same as one nanometer being stretched to over 10 light years in under a second. Now obviously, this seems to violate relativity. Nothing should be able to move faster than light speed, especially not that fast. In this case, however, the physical metric governing space-time changed, and so the universe changed not in size, but in scale. The benchmarks themselves were bypassed in this event. Think of it like resizing a picture. There's a good amount of evidence that this cosmic inflation occurred, and we're still observing its effects today. The elongation of space distributed the contents of the universe much more sparsely and relatively uniformly across its vast expanse. The energy of this inflationary field was released at the end of inflation, and it decayed into the first elementary particles, the first tiny building blocks of information in the universe. This field cooled further, and the entire universe was flooded with a dense, hot, quark-gluon plasma. It was from this plasma that the first molecules and atoms formed, which is why scientists believe that matter is distributed homogeneously across space. The density of the universe fell dramatically during inflation, causing supercooling. This allowed the temperature to fall below the threshold for a third event of symmetry breaking. At this point, all the elementary particles created by the quantum field gained mass, having been massless at higher energy levels. Electroweak interactions separated into electromagnetic and weak interactions, and the four fundamental forces that govern the universe had been established. And now, particles of mass had been formed to be bound by these forces. Within the first picosecond of time after the Big Bang, that's one trillionth of a second, the universe had emerged and was hot, voluminous and dense, but the groundwork was now in place for chemistry to occur. Plasma is the fourth state of matter, after solid, liquid and gas. It occurs when the electrons of an atom become so energetic that they start flying around, intersecting other loose electrons and joining atoms, allowing the plasma to act as one, in a big, super-hot, molten soup. It's the state that stars are in, and is the state of much of the matter in the universe, so much so that many believe we underestimate its role in the universe. This quark-gluon plasma at the end of inflation had no electrons, as electrons couldn't form yet, but all of the elementary particle components were flowing around and acting as one, all over the universe. Among these elementary particles are quarks, leptons and antiparticles. These quarks and leptons are capable of binding together, but during this increment of time in the early universe, known as the quark epoch, it was still too hot and too energetic for binds to stick. But then, a millionth of a second after the Big Bang had occurred, the temperature energy of the universe fell below this threshold, and now quarks could begin binding without being destroyed. This led to baryogenesis. Bound pairs of two or more quarks began forming, named hadrons. Baryons are a type of hadron that is composed of three quarks, such as protons and neutrons, the subatomic particles in the nucleus of an atom. But as the temperature fell still, there was no longer enough energy to form new hadron and antihadron pairs, and most of these pairs of opposites annihilated each other, creating high-energy photons in the process. Only a small number of hadrons remained as the hadron epoch drew to a close at one second of cosmic time. In one single second, the universe had formed, its laws had been established, and its particles had been bound. For the subatomic particles left, about one neutron remained for every seven protons. The spherical region of space that would become our present-day observable universe was about 20 light years across at this point, and there's no telling how large the rest of it was. All created in a single second. A neutrino is another kind of subatomic particle, and it's not the same as a neutron. While both are neutral in charge, a neutron is a large subatomic particle composed of quarks, whereas neutrinos are a kind of particle with a mass close to zero that do not interact much with ordinary matter, and so they are relativistic, meaning they travel at near light speed across space. Approximately one second after the Big Bang, these neutrinos that had formed from the plasma decoupled when they ceased to interact with the quark structures of the plasma. 
because these neutrinos were not affected by matter from here henceforth, they are still flying around in the universe today, but they have a very low rate of energy, approximately 10 billion times less than we are able to detect with current technology. As such, while we have strong evidence to suggest that these neutrinos created what is referred to as the cosmic neutrino background of the universe, we probably won't be able to detect this evidence of decoupling for a very long time, if at all. At this point, radiation dominates the behaviour of the cosmos. Tiny random fluctuations in energy and continuity during cosmic inflation have now led to some areas of matter being denser than others, and so some hypothesise that even this early on, only a second after the creation of the universe, some areas might have been dense enough to experience a gravitational collapse capable of forming a singularity. The universe may have seen its first primordial black holes. These are black holes which are not formed by stars, so therefore don't have to be as massive. In fact, the late astrophysicist Stephen Hawking predicted that these black holes could weigh as little as a billionth of a gram. We don't know how large they could have become, but recently ongoing efforts to find gravitational waves have detected black holes which we think could be primordial in origin. Primordial black holes are good candidates for the seeds of supermassive engine black holes at the centres of old, large galaxies. As they couldn't have formed from normal matter this early on, they are also plausible candidates for dark matter, another area of the standard model with questions surrounding it. In the nine seconds that followed these early black holes, the plasma was now composed of mostly leptons after the pairs of hadrons had destroyed each other. Leptons are another kind of elementary particle, which bind together the same as quarks, but form other varieties of subatomic particles, such as electrons and more neutrinos. The course of the lepton epoch mirrors that of the hadron epoch. The temperature falls below the point at which new lepton pairs can be formed and most of the pairs annihilate each other, giving rise to more high energy photons and leaving only a few leptons behind. Now the universe has protons, neutrons and electrons, the three parts of an atom. Between 2 and 20 minutes after the Big Bang, the temperature and pressure of the universe allowed nuclear fusion to occur and its products to remain stable. The protons and neutrons could now latch onto each other to become the first atomic nuclei. Around a quarter of these protons and 100% of the neutrons fused into elements. Initially it was deuterium, one of two hydrogen isotopes, which fused into helium-4, and at three minutes of cosmic time these light elements were stable. The problem is, fusion is a complicated and difficult process, and it can take thousands of years to begin forging heavier elements in a nuclear furnace so no heavy elements were able to form during this 18 minute window. When this process, known as nucleosynthesis, ended, the resulting matter of the universe was composed of about 3 quarters hydrogen nuclei, 25% helium nuclei, and less than a billionth of a percent of lithium nuclei. And with this process complete, the universe pauses for breath. Everything that has happened so far has done so in a period of about 20 minutes, but now everything that can happen straight away from the defrosting of the universe has happened. Photons continued to dominate the universe's behaviour for about 50,000 years, and as the universe continued to expand, the hydrogen and helium elements were now fairly evenly distributed across all areas of space, gradually being attracted to one another by gravity. At about 47,000 years of cosmic time, the universe has expanded so much that the density of photons is now lower than the density of matter, and the universe's large-scale behaviour begins to be dominated by matter instead of radiation. This matter is composed of about 15% baryonic matter and an estimated 85% cold dark matter. The reason we haven't touched upon dark matter so far is because, while there is strong evidence that dark matter exists, we still do not understand its nature, and thus we're not sure what role it played in the events of the early universe. However, from the point of matter domination onward, this dark matter helped to accelerate cosmic structure formation by adding mass. Dark matter groups and gathers into huge filaments across space the same way baryonic matter would, but because dark matter does not interact with light, it groups faster than normal matter because it is not slowed down by radiation pressure. So these dark matter filaments formed quickly across space, laying the blueprints for the first galactic megastructures billions of years later. The reason we don't see any evidence of these dark matter structures is because they're invisible and undetectable, for present day technology at least. Because dark matter doesn't interact with light at all, it doesn't lose energy as it travels. However, when normal matter loses energy, it loses energy that would otherwise keep it apart from other matter, and so structures of ordinary matter can collapse into denser concentrations. 
Where dark matter doesn't lose this energy, it prevents gravitationally bound dark matter from collapsing beyond a certain density. So while the early universe was filled with these massive dark matter filaments, they would have been diffuse. The ordinary matter of the universe was then dragged towards these dark matter filaments, causing it to come together and form things faster along these arms. Fast forward another 50,000 years and the universe is celebrating its 100,000th birthday. And it has now cooled enough that the atomic nuclei that have grouped along the filaments in huge colonies can now begin to bind together and remain stable, the first molecule forms. This molecule is helium hydride, one helium atom bound to one hydrogen atom, with one electron removed. This composite structure of atoms played a key role in the eventual formation of stars. There won't be any for hundreds of millions of years yet, but gravity is pulling this matter together silently as the universe expands, and it does so for another 270,000 years. So far, the matter in the universe has been at a high enough temperature that it formed an ionised plasma. Ionisation occurs when an electron is removed from a neutral atom, giving it an overall electrical charge. Light photons are absorbed by charged particles, and so they cannot travel long distances through plasma. This would have given the universe an opaque appearance, kind of like a thick fog which you could barely see through. But once the universe was 377,000 years old, it cooled to the point that these free electrons could now rejoin these atomic nuclei of protons and neutrons. This event was called recombination. Because this process is more efficient with energy, most hydrogen atoms joined with high energy electrons, which released light as they joined the nuclei. By the end of recombination, most of the atoms formed were neutral, and thus didn't interact with light. This meant that the universe was no longer a soup, and the photons released during the event could now travel freely and indefinitely across space. Before this, the universe would have appeared as a soft, opaque orange colour, but then, recombination meant that the universe became transparent to visible light. And so, those final photons emitted are still firing across the universe today. Initially, they had a temperature energy of about 4000 Kelvin, but over billions of years the universe has expanded and the wavelengths of these photons has been elongated. This process turns visible light red, and as such we call it redshift. This has occurred for so long however that these photons wavelengths are now much longer and their frequencies are much lower, at a temperature energy of about 2.7 Kelvin, and so they shifted out of the visible spectrum and into the infrared spectrum, and then into the microwave spectrum. The photons released during recombination are the oldest light in the universe that we can still detect today, but you can't see microwaves. Instead, you have to listen for them. No matter where you point your radio telescope in the night sky, you will hear a consistent microwave band static, and if we map it, we get this. The cosmic microwave background. You've probably seen a picture of the CMB before, it is one of science's most iconic discoveries, even though it was discovered by accident, when researchers at Bell Telephone Laboratories picked up static coming from all points of the sky as they attempted to construct a radio receiver. What they actually discovered was, in layman's terms, the afterglow of the Big Bang. So this noise is the nearly 13.8 billion year old remnants of recombination. The difference in colour on our maps represents tiny fluctuations in temperature, caused by ripples during cosmic inflation. But overall, the universe appears isotropic and homogeneous. And with that, the universe ceased to be an opaque orange oven of plasma, and as the CMB photons faded over millions of years, the universe became the dark expanse we are more used to today. Light could now travel freely across space, but there were no light-emitting sources. The universe had entered its dark age. The photons of the CMB took approximately 3 million years to fade into the infrared spectrum, by which time the universe had cooled from some 4000 Kelvin down to 60 Kelvin. From that point onwards, space was pitch black. The universe experienced total darkness for the first time. Gradually, gas clouds of hydrogen and helium molecules began to group together over the next few hundred million years, enough time for sufficiently massive clouds to condense and experience a gravitational collapse. As the density of these clouds rose, so too did their temperatures, and eventually a familiar process played out for the first time. The first stars began illuminating the universe. These were the first coherent structures to form in the universe. 
giant spherical fusion engines in plasma state, essentially a giant explosion held together by its own gravity. We've yet to observe these infant stars because those oldest galaxies where we might be able to find them are just too far away, but scientists believe that these stars emerged 300 million years after the Big Bang, and they are known as Population 3 stars. Stars with very few metals and short lifespans of merely a few million years, which took the initial hydrogen and helium of the early universe and started making it into heavier elements, like lithium, oxygen and carbon. And thus began the Stelliferous Era, the ongoing age of new star formation throughout the universe. These elementary stars could have been tiny or massive. The larger stars were unstable and had short lifespans, causing them to explode in the first supernovae, which bedazzled the dark universe and deposited heavier elements into the clouds around them. More complex stars could now form from these richer clouds, stars with longer lifespans. For those well suited enough to survive in the long term, they would have been attracted to one another over millions of years into small clusters and then larger groups of hundreds and then thousands and then millions. These communities of stars began congregating along the dark matter filaments whose extra mass meant that structure formation was accelerated and while the exact timing of the first galaxies is up for debate, we believe it to be sometime between 380 and 400 million years after the Big Bang. At this point we no longer have to conduct experiments to recreate this era of the young universe, instead we can observe it directly. GNZ 11 is the current oldest and most distant galaxy we've ever observed. It formed at this early stage of structure formation and so what you are currently looking at right now happened about 13.5 billion years ago. GNZ 11 suggests that stellar formation and galaxy formation was surprisingly fast. The earliest galaxies were dwarf galaxies large, fairly scattered colonies of stars, but by 800 million years of cosmic time they were merging, with their cores combining, creating spiral galaxies bound by central supermassive black holes, and within these active galactic centres the first quasars lit up the universe, with their light radiating billions of light years across space, so much so that we are still picking them up today. The light we've detected from the most distant quasars indicates the presence of elements such as carbon and iron, further evidence of fast, early star formation and destruction. Around these black holes, in the halos of their galaxies, a new population of stars formed, Population 2 stars, low metal stars which burn brighter and illuminate the cores of their galaxies. Eventually, every corner of the universe knew light, and at one billion years of cosmic time, the dark ages had officially come to an end. The universe had reached an age of maturity, and it has appeared much the same ever since. The galaxies within became gravitationally bound over the next few billion years, and they clustered together in large structures, covering unimaginable distances along the dark matter laid web that marks the present day cosmic web, the 3D path across our universe. Between the dense arms of the cosmic web, the first voids appeared, some of them millions of light years across. The diameters of coherent, gravitationally bound galactic structures grew to hundreds of millions of light years, and the present day structure of the universe was finally established. Among the galactic superclusters, one exists named the Lanikia Supercluster. Around 8 billion years ago, a galaxy formed within the bounds of this structure called the Milky Way, a galaxy that hosts a particular G-type main sequence dwarf star, and at just the right distance from this star, a planet formed which would become covered in water, and would eventually give rise to the most mysterious phenomenon of them all, life. It's amazing to think about how much of this universe we actually know, not bad for walking talking molecular systems bound to a chunk of rock orbiting a continuous explosion, but what's even more impactful and somewhat unsettling to think about is how much we still don't know. We know so much about how, yet nothing about why. Perhaps if we knew more about why the universe began, we would be able to understand where we are headed. The cosmos is currently a vast, stable place in which life can emerge, but it hasn't always been this way, and like all things, it can't last. 